I give you a moment of silence, and especially those who are with us visiting by the internet, we encourage you to use the same protocol that we give our people for Bible study. You cannot study the Bible in carnality, and I am assuming that if you're watching this, it's because you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day to give you everlasting life. When that occurred in the church age, the Holy Spirit took up residence inside your body, and your body became the temple of God. The Holy Spirit is there to teach you the truth of the Word of God, John chapters 14, 15, and 16. You cannot study the Bible in carnality. You say, well, how would I know if I'm carnal? Well, there would be evidence of personal sin in your life because the Holy Spirit's been grieved and quenched and is convicting. Not only do you have a conscience that convicts you, but you have a Holy Spirit over the issue of sin. And therefore, what do you do? Well, the Holy Spirit is not going anywhere, John 14, 16. He's not going to leave you. So what do you do? Well, 1 John 1, 9 says, If I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Why is that important? This, listen, this is not a salvation passage. This is a sanctification passage. What you need in carnality is be sanctified, to be restored to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's not a salvation issue. This is a sanctification issue. This is how you are spiritual is because of the Spirit. And that's how that works. So I'm going to give you a moment to think about that, to make confession if necessary. That's protocol for classroom. That's classroom etiquette, at least in this church. And those who are with me by internet, I require that. Father, we're thankful today for your love, mercy, and grace. And we thank you for Sonny being with us. Just good to see him again. And still faithful, still has his hands on the plow and not looking back. I mean, how good is that? I pray today, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word God to us about equality with God. This is a passage that first truly, truly that comes out is all about the equality of, of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we're dealing with hypostatic union in theology, undiminished deity and true humanity and one unique man of the universe, a man called Jesus Christ, called Emmanuel, God with us. And so, Father, teach us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are in this new teaching of, of Jesus Christ recorded by John. John records that he said truly, truly twice. And he said it at the beginning. Now, what you got when Jesus uses it, <clears throat> is this, and this is important because you were in the Gospels. It's really important when uh, John records that Jesus put this on the front, what you have, what the doctrine is that he's introducing to you is a messianic doctrine. It's something about Christ that's a, 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 that is very important for us to understand in his first coming. In fact, it's essential to qualify him to go to the cross. And what you're going to see in this, now look, I want you to watch this now. Look, we're looking at verses 19 through 23. And what we're looking for, listen to me now. What we're, what we're looking for is the relationship between God the Father and God the Son. Now watch this. Look in, look at, let's go back to verse 19. <clears throat> see the words Father and Son? Just pan, pan your eyes down. See it? Father, Son, right? Look at verse 20. Father, Son. See that? Look at verse 21. Father, Son. Look at verse 22. Father, Son. Look at verse 23. Father, Son. These are markers. When, when, as a Bible student, you're looking for markers. Do you see that? That's what this whole... Dis that truly, truly is saying to you that the Father and the Son are one. That they, there is equality in between the Father and the Son. Now, now watch how he does this. 
And see, he introduced... Now look at verse 24 for a moment. See, he starts another truly, truly. Do you see that? Look at verse 25. He does another truly, truly. Today I'm dealing with the first one. All right? Next week I'll deal with the second one. I'm not going to skip them because they're vitally important. What he's telling us, and that, now look, we've already had this in the first chapter. He's already done this in chapter 1. He has done it in chapter 3 with Nicodemus. He did it with Nathaniel. Remember, in chapter 1, he was dealing with Nathaniel. In chapter 3, he was dealing with Nicodemus. In chapter 5, he's dealing with uh, the Sabbath police. So he's dealing with. Now, look. Um, Picking back up in the story of the man who was healed and, the, and uh, the Sabbath police get him and all that. The man went away, he, and Jesus, listen, verse 14, afterward, after he got the ticket, afterward Jesus found him in the temple, and he said to him, Behold, you have become well. <laughs> Look at here. Da, 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 da. Look how well you're doing. Oh, yes. Uh, do not sin anymore so that nothing worse may befall upon you. Well, he finds out who his, who, who his name is, because that's important, because they'll, re, they'll retrieve his ticket. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well, who had healed him. For this reason, because he got healed on a Sabbath, which wasn't a scriptural um, break-in violation, it was a tradition of the elders, this little handbook of these idiots, that they did it. And so the man went away. He said, for this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. And Jesus answered them. He said, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. This caused, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because now he not only broke the Sabbath, but he's calling God his Father, making him equal with God. Do you understand that? See, they gave me the title of my lesson. They got that and rejected it. They were on the big messianic truth that the Messiah, the Son of Man, would be the Son of God and would be equal with him. As, as the Son of God. And they identified it and went negative. Therefore, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you. And he gives them verse 19 through 23. And it's all about the Father and the Son. Agreed? It's all about the Father and the Son. So remember this, actually when it says truly, truly, what he's actually saying is a man, a man. And he's introduced a new a new teaching of doubling the amen on the front of a doctrine. These Every doctrine that we're going to read in the book of John has to do with messianic. It's a messianic doctrine that you would better not miss because I'm going to the cross for the sins of the world. All of them is about the qualifying the Lamb of God that's coming to the world, take away the sin of the world. All of it. All of it. There's so much evidence in the book of John for it that when John gets to Revelation, the third chapter, 14, he calls Jesus the Amen. Like the beginning and the end, he is the Amen. <laughs> uh, that's John, still writing. You understand? So, let's talk about this uh, in, a, in a, a few points that we have. Number one, the doubling of the Amen at the beginning of a Messianic doctrine alerts the audience to pay attention because it requires a positive response. Here's what he's saying when he says, when he says, Amen, Amen. I say to you. See, they, everybody goes like, what? It's saying, you better pay attention because I'm giving you, because Amen, Amen always meant a great, it is that doxology, a great doctrine, a great doctrinal truth. All of these are messianic. 
He's going to tell them something about himself they better not miss. So he says, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself. Okay? At the beginning, the doubling of this, at the beginning of this, and he alerts the audience to pay attention because it requires a positive response of faith at the end. See, the, the Jews, not the, not the, not not us in the church age. We, we don't understand that. But a Jew knew better to say amen if he didn't believe it. You're going to be held accountable for that. See, we say it, we don't even give it a second thought. Amen, brother. But a, you, not a Jew. That's a doxology business. You know, be, you know, it's kind of like taking a cup of Eucharist. If you don't believe that Jesus is your Savior and you haven't confessed it, don't take that cup. We'll make it a hospital call on you. Now take that cup. That's kind of what this is here. And so the Jew, the Jew certainly understood the dynamics of this truly, truly, or amen, amen. And it requires a positive response or be silent. Don't say amen if you don't mean it, because God holds that amen. That's a covenant. That's a covenant. You've entered a covenant. Don't be doing that. If you don't mean it, you better keep silent. And what it means is that you're agreeing. So let it, so, so let it be so. So let it be so. Which is a wonderful commitment of faith. Bring it on. Father, I want, I want all you got more. See, that's a wonderful response. Now, I want to show you something else. Dealing with the intimate all of this is about the Father, Son, and how they're equal. They understood that he's declared himself to be equal with God. Uh huh. But let me tell you why. See, that's charges of blasphemy, unless it's not. If that's not true, that's blasphemous. But the question is what if it's true? <laughs> then what do you call it? If it's not true, it's blasphemy. What do you call it if it is true? That's the point he's making. What do you call it? You call it equality with God. You call it equal with God. And that's proof that whoever can do that is the Son of God. That's what he told Nicodemus. How is it that you, being a scholar of the, Jew, of the Jewish Bible, don't understand these things? You being a great teacher don't understand this. You must be born again. How is it that you don't understand that? Well, in this, he's talking about the intimate relationship between the Son and the God. Listen, let me show you how, let me show you how intimate that this is. Look, look at verse 19 when he says, these things, he says, the son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner. You know what we call that in English? Mimic. That's what we call it. And how is that? How is it, how is it rare? How... How rare would it be that, it's, that a son might reflect or mimic the behavior of his father? How weird is that, my friend? Well, everybody, if they got a wit of sense, would know, well, that's normal, right? In the human realm, that's normal. In the spiritual realm, it is too. And there's a lesson for you and I. As sons of God, we should reflect or that we should reflect the image or the likeness, or the manner of God in our life. Hua? That's a hua. So I'm sparing you, amen. Just give me a hua. And that'll be all right with me. Um, that's the main one. Now let me show you something else uh, John records that caught his attention. Because John's after markers. So here's what John saw. John saw, now, now the whole thing is the relationship between the Father and the Son, agreed? Verse 19, 20, 21, 20, right? Every verse, that's what he's pounded. Would you agree? 
He said in verse 19, said it in 20, 21, 22, 23. There's not a verse there under this truly, truly that he did not pound that idea. Agreed? And their own lips said that he's declaring himself equal with God, and he is. And he's proven it. Are you with me? All right, it's important. It's important. Now, I want to show you what he does. These are markers. These are study markers to prove a point. They're going to use it five times. Five. Poyeo. Five times. And the English is going to translate it. Truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing for whatever the father does. These things the son also does in like manner. The father loves the son and shows himself all things that he himself is doing and greater works than these will he show him that you may marvel. Five times the word is due. One of the ways you can know that the father and the son are one are they do the same things. They're not contradictive. It is a theme. And Jesus is going to call these in verse 20, he's going to call them greater works. He's going to call them divine production. He's going to call them greater works. He's going to call this is the doing, the do this, do that, do this, do that is the work of God. The evidence that God is at work. He just healed a man on the Sabbath that had been an invalid, unable to get a man, a hopeless, helpless case. Listen to me. Jesus healed him. Whoa. Listen to me. I don't care what they tell you. I don't care what the medical people tell you. You've got Wanga Ganga and you can't get cured from it. This is hopeless. This is, this is your life. This is who you are. I'm going to tell you, there is one person, one person in this universe that can change that. He's called the great physician. He can, whatever law that, whatever natural law you're under, he has the power to reverse. Come on now. He could, he healed the blind. He raised the dead. Whatever natural law, creative law you're under, he has authority over it in your life. Come on now. And if he does... And if he has, and if he does, it's, it's evidence that he has the greater work of God and it's his name that's valuable. And if you're going to honor the Father, the Son equal honor. If you're going to honor the Son, it honors the Father. This word, listen, I wonder, how does the greater works of Christ affect your life? Here is all the evidence of him. All, now all of this evidence is out, and he just fills up the pages with it. Why isn't that evidence of who he is? And you know what all that's for? To send him to a cross. All of this, all of this, that, that's Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. He preached at his home church, his first sermon in his home church. Synagogue. I mean, how do I know that this is the Christ? Because he's doing Christ's work. 
Where does he get the power? He's the Son of God. Listen, he's still the most powerful person in the universe. In fact, listen to me. He's more powerful today than he was when he was on earth. Because when he sat down at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, God gave him all authority of heaven and earth. He controls the universe. This little word do is a powerful word because he's talking about this relationship between the Father and the Son. It becomes a key word. In verse 21, that's verse 20 and 21. Uh, 19 and 20. In verse 21, there's another word that's used. It's used twice. Don't miss it. These are key, these are key ideas because these are five ideas. In verse, 20, uh, in verse 21, just as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so. Here's what people miss. See the words just as, even so? That's powerful. It means just as you have this, even so, you have that. If you've got that, you got this. You know, listen, I'm going to fill up your front seat, and I'm going to promise you that if I fill up your front seat, I'm going to fill up your back seat. Once he filled up the front seat, we're feeling pretty good about the back seat, right? That's just as even so. Just as even so. Now look at just that. Now, he's talked about the greater works of do, the do. Then he comes into verse 21, just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he wishes. That's the second point of evidence. Greater works is one, raising the dead. Listen, you know what we're talking about? We're t he healed somebody that was absolutely incurable. He cured. You know how he did it? He spoke it. He said to him, he didn't say, I'm going to heal. He didn't go through the Lord. He just said, looked, looked right into his eyes and he said, pick up your mat and walk away. And he did it. Power over death. Power, power over sickness. He can reverse, can reverse natural laws, creative laws. He, has that, he had that power. He's got more power today than he did then. Then in verse 22, he's got the word judgment is used twice. Look at verse 22. For not even the Father judges anybody, but he's given all judgment to the Son. Judgment. Judgment. And listen, Jesus understood that. Jesus said, I didn't come, I didn't come into, into the world to judge the world. But to what? Save it. Come on now. Uh -huh. hmm? Judgment. Do you know why? You know when he says that? All judgment? When he says that, he said, listen, I I've got absolute righteousness and justice. You know, in other words, for God to be the great judge, listen, he, he is equal with God in judgment because he holds the same essence of God. That's a powerful idea. And it's, and it's true that the Jew understood that he, he would be a judge. What they missed, that he would have two advents. They thought he'd only have one. Here's the final. It is the word honor. In verse 23, in order, don't miss some of these key words now, in order that all may honor the Son even as they honor the Father, he who does, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. You know what's interesting? Verse 19 and 20, the father's listed first and the son's second. Verse 21, the father's listed first, the son's list second. Verse 23, father's listed first, son's list second. But when it comes to honor, he reversed it. Let me show you why. M Matthew, go to the book of Matthew with me. 
Somewhere, somewhere, I'm ahead of my paper, but that's not unusual. Um, Matthew, I'm, I'm going to pull out Matthew 6 right now. I, I'm looking for Matthew 21. And, and the parable, a very famous parable that Jesus gives on what, what is referred to as the tenants. Uh, and that is verses... Um, 33, begins in verse 33. Listen to another parable. And listen, this is what, this is going to be, he's talking about it way up here in the John 5, and he's going to give a parable of absolutely what, what this verily, verily I say unto you is about. Watch this. Listen to another parable, he said. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, built a tower, rented it out to vine growers, and went on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent servants or slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. The vine growers took his slaves and beat one, killed one, stoned a third. Again, he sent another group of servants, larger than the first. They did the same thing. Afterwards, he sent his son to them, thinking they will respect, they will honor my son. Listen, they will honor my son. Why? Because they've honored me. They'll honor my son. Well, listen, they haven't honored the father. They haven't honored the father and his servants. But this is different. This is my son. This is the heir. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him. Seize his inheritance. So they took him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vine vineyard comes, what will he do with these vine growers? Here's the Sabbath ticket givers. They said to him, he will bring those wretcheds to a wretched end and he will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper time of season. And then Jesus goes on to this whole discussion. And when the chief priest, verse 45, and when the chief priest and the Pharisees heard this parable, they understood that he was speaking about them. And so they sought to seize him, but feared the multitude because they held him to be a prophet. You see, that's what I'm talking about here. And listen, in our passage of John, what he did is he reversed it. He reversed it in this story, and it sets up the parable. In order that all... You can see how Jesus in this truly, truly is, is pleading for the people who are in the audience. In verse 20, for example, he said that greater works that you may marvel. And then down in verse 23, in order that all may honor the Son even as they honor the Father, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. There's so much for religion out there that goes like, oh, I honor God, I honor God, I honor God. The question is, do you believe that Jesus came into this world uh, as the Son of God to die on a cross for your sins? Do you believe he's the Lamb of God that died and was buried and raised on the third day? Listen, there's the proof in the pudding. It's not do you honor God. You don't honor God if you don't honor his Son. If you honor his Son, you've honored the Father because the Father sent him. That's the honor code. This is an honor code between the relationship between the Father and Jesus Christ the Son. The second thing is that he says, that's the first thing. Now here's the second thing he says, unless it is something he sees the Father doing. Now I'm going to show you something. We very seldom see this word Connected with Jesus seeing something with the Father or seeing something in you. This is not the word horeo. This is the word blepo. And blepo means to be able to see it as a witness. This means to be able to see it with the eye as a witness. 
not in the mind where I put one and one and two, one and one is two. And I've thought this thing out and I've come to realize this is, I saw it. I was standing. It was two o'clock. I looked at my watch. How do I know? Well, I was waiting for the bus and I'm standing right there at the corner waiting on the bus. It shows up at two. I look down there. There it comes. So boom, a guy walks out in front of the bus gets him. That's a blip -o. and now you're called as a witness. It's a blip -o. This is important. Listen to what he just said. Listen to just what he said. You missed it. But listen to what he said. Unless it is something, I can do nothing. Unless it is something, I can do nothing. Unless it is something, do I need to say it again? I can do nothing. <laughs> Unless it is something, I have seen with my own eyes, the Father do. How about that? Huh? You and I never have that experience until we get to glory. Now, where did he say all that stuff? Because he came from the Father and he's going back to the Father. He's saying, look, I'm on vacation right now. <laughs> Whatever that trip to Earth was about, wasn't much of a vacation in my mind, but we've probably had one, a vacation like that, I don't know. Unless it is something he sees the Father doing. Here's the third thing. Whatever. Now look at this. Nothing, something, whatever. I love that word, whatever. Whatever. You know, kids are doing it together. Whatever. Now I don't like it that way. Maybe the old song, whatever will be, will be. Salah, salah, French. <laughs> I, I finally got to the French. How about that? Thank you, Father. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. He mimics his dad. Whatever these things, we do know as, as fathers, if somebody say, well, I don't know. I, I could only think of illustrations of me and my son Bill, so I don't want to give any. <laughs> ah, here's fourth. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And now he's in a learning process. Oh, you're missing this. Let me show you that. Jesus had to grow spiritually into the will of God and surrender his life to it just like you and I. Now watch this. Oh, you say it's probably easier for him. Oh, yeah. Huh. Devil never took me to a mountain. Well, not that I remember. He may have got me in my sophomore year in college, and I didn't know. <laughs> well, anyhow. Uh, did, I tell you, did I tell you to look up Luke 2.40? I wonder why nobody was turning. I guess you're waiting for me to say it in French. <laughs> Listen to this. Here's, here's the child, Jesus. The child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. This is a perfect humanity of Christ, learning the word of God, because it's essential to his mission on earth, and it's no different in your life and mine. Look at verse... Um, 47. He, now he, he's not a child. When we're in verse 47, he's 12 years old. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. He's with the, he's with the theologians. And then verse uh, 52. Now we're talking about Jesus ready to enter his ministry in chapter 3. 
And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with men. Notice how important the order is. Your spiritual growth, maturity, is to develop your relationship with God so that that can develop your relationship with man. That's pretty good stuff, people. See the word show? And point number four there, see the word, and it's also in point five. See the word show? Dekuomai. Dekuomai is a word that means an exhibit. I know Sonny is a, it's got a photography business, and I, he probably goes on uh, exhibition type of things, right? What do you call them? <laughs> we, we speak the same language, French. Uh, this means to exhibit it, means to exhibit it. You take all your, your good stuff, right, and show it, and uh, whatever you do. But this is the word, this is the word to show, uh, means to exhibit. In verse 5, and the point 5, and the Father will show him, that will exhibit to him as he's learning and progressing. The Father will show him greater works than these. What are the these? Well, that's the showing, that's the show and tell that he's got in point number 4, is now turning into uh, more expansive and greater works. See? Listen, here's my point, and don't miss it. This is why you study the Word of God. That's why you go through the faith cycle. This is why 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, all Scripture is God-breathed, inhaled, exhaled, cycled through. Why? Because of the will of God. That it's, it's essential to the operation of the will of God and the sovereignty working through our life. Now here's point three. Oh, let, let me do John 5, 36. It's on your paper. The testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John the Baptist. For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do. Test, test, they testify about me that the Father has sent me. See, that was the whole deal. And, and listen, the question should be for Israel, why did God send his son? And he told Nicodemus, didn't he? Because you must be born again. You must be born again. Why did, why did God send his son into the world? Because you must be born again. And the only way you can be born, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. That's a narrow road. I grew up on narrow roads. How about you? We didn't have no, I didn't grow up as a kid, I know. Five, six lane highway that everybody can get killed on. Just a little narrow road you get killed on. Here's point number three. The perfect humanity of Jesus Christ was helpless apart from the sovereign will of God in his life. Now I want you to turn to Philippians. This is a famous passage on this. Philippians, the second chapter. I want to be sure I cover it before I leave today. With you. Second chapter, we're going. What people sometimes miss is in verse 5, he says, and if 5 through 8 is one section of this. It's just one section. Okay? That's only one section. But listen to what he says Have this attitude in yourself, which also was in Christ Jesus. So that's what we're after. We're, have to, we're after this attitude, the attitude that drives our life to be victorious in the devil's world. I mean, what is the attitude I must possess to be victorious in the devil's world? What's, what's my attitude should be? See, it's attitude. I mean, I, it would surprise people when, when, with the word attitude. It surprises people. They think about a thousand things. It wouldn't be attitude. So this is what he says. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who, Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, deity, did not regard equality of God a thing to be grasped. And he said that earlier. 
I can do nothing apart. I can do nothing of myself is what he's talking about. But emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. In other words, understanding I must live by perfect humanity, operating in the sovereignty of God. Because my mission in life is not to persuade people, but to go on a cross and die for their sins. Now, he was a brilliant man and a great scholar. But that's not who God hung on the cross. You know who God hung on the cross? A lamb. That's come to take away the sin of the world. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. That's perfect humanity he's talking about. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Watch this now. See, he, he's taken off God as a primary force to be reckoned with to make that the primary force to be reckoned with is perfect humanity surrendered to the sovereign will of God. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself as a man, perfect man, by the way. He humbled himself as a man by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Now watch. Nine, 10, and 11 is about how God honored that in the Son. Listen to how God, therefore, also God highly exalted him, bestowed on him. You know where he is? He is up from the grave. He arose. He is back to heaven with the Father and seated on the right hand of God the Father in heaven with authority. hoo -ah. Therefore, also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow. Those who are in heaven, earth, under the earth, every tongue would confess that Jesus Lord to the glory of the Father. That's how the Father honored him. You understand? Know how did the Son honor the Father? By being obedient to the cross. Listen, he tells you, by humbling himself, by coming obedient to the point of death. Yes, death on the cross. And listen to me. As terrible as that whole picture may seem, that was a good thing, wasn't it? Because we get saved by grace through faith. We don't have to go through the agony of that kind of death for sin and judgment. I mean, there's no way that, no way that was an even swap. And yet in the eyes of God, he says grace. That's an amazing thing. For by grace I'm saved through faith and not of myself as a gift of God, not of works. Man, how clear could that be? When, and I gave you some verses important, like you sh later today you ought to read sometime. This is potty reading, come on. Hebrews 1.3, the humanity of Christ, how important that was in Hebrews 1.3. 2 Corinthians 5.21, how important that is. He who knew no sin became sin, that I might be made the righteous of God in him. I mean, how important is that stuff? I mean, that's who I am today, by the grace of God. Uh, I listen to what he says in John 5, 30. I can do nothing on my own initiative. Listen, if there's one guy in this whole wide world could do that, it'd be him. And he didn't. I can do nothing. That's a pretty strong statement. You mean nothing? You mean when you healed that invalid of 38 years? Yeah, I'd get permission. Well, Jesus said, look, I walked up to the pool. As the son of God, knowing that this was my moment. 
And I'm going, think, I'm thinking through my mind, I'm thinking of Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. And I, I panoram this whole business. And I see five, six, seven people in there I could, I could, I could perform a miracle on. So what do I have to do? I'll tell you what I have to do. If Jesus was here, he would tell you. Here's what I do. I have a mode of prayer with the Father because I, the Son can do nothing apart from the Father. I can do nothing. So I pause in my soul and say, Father, here I am. I'm celebrating the Passover. Do you know how big that is with that lamb and the blood on the post? Do you know how big a deal that is? Imagine how big a deal that day is for Jesus. Here I am. Where does my blood, who, who does my blood touch today? I've got this person, that person, this person, that person. Listen, he has to go to the Father. Listen, he's told us five times he can do nothing for, apart from the Father. He's told us all over the book of John. So he has to do what all of us should do instead of going like a bull in a china shop. We should stop and have a moment of prayer because the Father and Son are one. We, we are one. And we want to be with one. We set aside any, any kind of other distraction in our life to have that one moment with God that says, how do I do this? And he says, hey, look at that guy over there. Yeah, I noticed him earlier. Take a good look at him and watch. See how he can't get in? Yeah. He's our guy. He walks over there and wonders what he's going to say to him. The guy looks up, pleads with him in his eyes. What, what, what can I do for you? He said, well, look, if, if you could just help me get into the water, I'm going to do one better for you, son. I'm going to do one better for you. Wouldn't you like to know what happened to this guy's life? Huh? Wouldn't that be a story to tell? Wouldn't that be a story to tell him when he goes home to see his people? Can you imagine what, how important Passover is going to be in his life when he remembers it was on Passover that the Passover lamb stopped at my place at the pool and not only heal my body, but heal my soul. My life has never been the same. That's true for Ron Adema. It's true for me. And I tell everybody who will listen to me, I tell everybody who will listen to me, what a wonderful Savior saved me, a guy like me. you know that that guy had a story to tell. You know he had a story to tell. There's another part of this. I, I, I want you to circle this and another opportunity for you to read something. Be sure to read this. Notice at John 5.30, there's an 8.12 through 20. That's well worth your read in context. Point four, Jesus' ability to raise the dead was without was another feature of equality with God. In John 5, 21, he said, For just as the Father raise, raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. I don't know if I wrote this on your paper. If I didn't, I would write it down if I was you. John 12, 47, Jesus said, I didn't come to judge the world. I came to save it came to save it. That's going to apply. That's going to be important to your point five. Jesus' ability to judge <coughs> with absolute righteousness and divine justice is another feature. Look. Any judgment 
that I would be fearful of has already been paid for me. You understand that? I mean, there's no fear of death in my heart, nor any fear of judgment to follow. You know why? Because of the great salvation I have, the judgment's all been paid for. This is why I stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I'm looking to get crowns and rewards. I'm looking to make the Hall of Fame. I'm not fearful of it. Let me close with this. The divine purpose of Jesus' equality of God is man's response to the honor code. If you got anything else, listen, there's an amen. At the end of this lesson, it requires an amen. Uh, a, truly, truly, I say unto you, requires a response. <clears throat> RSVP. It requires a response. That's, that's what a man requires. So that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And it's always good to remember who he was addressing that parable to. Uh, not parable, but uh, that truly, truly. Remember that it was the apostate Jews who gave the invalid of 38 years a ticket. The Sabbath police gave him a ticket because Jesus healed him and he picked up his mat and walked home. That's religion at its best. For this reason, John 5, 18, for this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he also was calling God his Father, making him equal with God, and he sure was. <laughs> and he sure was. Guilty as charged. Guilty as charged. He certainly was making himself equal with God. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for your love and mercy and grace. Al said it well when he talked about Hebrews 4.16. Confidence approached the throne of grace in time of need. You're a father who cares for his children. You're a perfect father, even when we're not perfect children. But I can tell you for me, I can do nothing apart from you, have no desire to do it. And every time I have, it's turned on me. I pray today, Father, that we might take this serious. Why did Christ come into this world? Yes, but why did he come into my life in this world? Might be the bigger question for us today. Why did he come in my life? in the world. I mean, that's the question we ought to ask. And what are we doing about it? For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.